Okay, here we go. It's a five, four, three. Hey, hey, we're back. We're back up here on the stage with a little bit more of the Live from the Heartland show. And uh, we're really happy to have our old pal, Dan McNeil. Dan has uh, not only been a longtime community organizer, but he's a, a spiritual, spiritual and physical instructor, teacher, and a poet historian. And he's actually going to perform tomorrow night at the Side Theater. And it's part of the... Side choosing. Theater and Jarvis, right? That's right. And it's part of the Choosing to Be Here, a festival of storytelling. And uh, we've got Dan here, and we've got Kim Morris, who is actually the co-curator of the entire festival. So good morning to the two of you. Oh, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Let's start off with wow. Kim. Kim, how about you telling us a little bit about what this is all about, this, uh, this project, which is called Choosing to Be Here. Yeah, great. Um, we... Uh, came up with this idea about a year ago and we were trying to figure out how we can get storytelling um, sort of people who are in various aspects of um, different communities throughout the city to tell their stories and uh, the curators and I, um, Megan Shuckman, Julie Ganey and Adam Webster are all very involved in theater and the storytelling community but we wanted to know how can we get people outside of that community to come in and tell us what is unique about their lives and um, we are basing our festival off of Julie Julie Ganey's solo show, which is uh, about living in, in Rogers Park and what it means to be a good neighbor and how you connect with people who are uh, different than you and similar to you. And a lot of what we um, asked our other storytellers to do was to write stories revolving around that theme. And Julie Ganey's solo show was where? I'm not familiar with. She has performed it at um, at the Philea Solo Festival at right. Lifeline, and also at 16th Street Theater um, most recently. Yeah. All right, yeah, yeah. that's uh, uh, I think uh, another good friend, storyteller of ours, Susan O'Halloran, was part of that Philea of Solo. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Great festival. And I was blessed to um, be the uh, rhythmic support in that in her first production yeah that's an interesting title there's a job you guys can study for <laughs> rhythmic support let's hear you repeat that out there it's not percussion anymore it's rhythmic support I love that you're such a word dude Dan well, that's why I feel so blessed to be a part of this uh, <laughs> this festival. I was going to say that we're due to be happy to be on the show. <laughs> Somebody and I thought, so, I thought you were going to say to Katie, speak for yourself. <laughs> well, Dan, uh, tell us a little bit about just briefly what you've been doing, because you spend a lot of time up there with the young kids on the street, and uh, you do a lot of good work. You involve them in poetry and music. You yourself are quite a performer. Uh, I know you're a hell of an athlete. Uh, tell us what you're up to and how you got involved in this festival. Well, I got, um, because I worked with Julie in her uh, other performance, um, she brought to my attention that there was this uh, choosing to be there. <clears throat> and like most of us, there's a lot of things we uh, want to say, need to say, just for our own sense of healthy expression. Uh, expression is a way to heal. <clears throat> So, uh, so that's how I got involved with the uh, side project. Uh, uh, in my working life, I'm working at Family Matters, the director of the Young Men's Program, and that definitely brings a lot of stories <laughs> to be told and to share. So I thought when Julie came to me and said, you know, that they were having this, I said, oh yes, I would love to share some stories. And it was interesting, one thing that was interesting about this storytelling event, um, work with other writers, uh, the theme of, of, the, of this storytelling is community. And uh, I, I found it very interesting that a lot of people who were telling their stories who were in their 50s, 60s, and 70s were telling stories about things that happened to them when they were kids. And it's so interesting to see how our sense of community is formed from events that, that happened to us when we were the most vulnerable um, and, and impressionable. And so that was a very interesting just um, thing that came out of that. Sure, that makes total sense. That's what we all do, and mm -hmm. you're right. I mean, to point out that that's when kids, that's when human beings get their first definition mm -hmm. of community, of family, of yeah. love, of what's important, what's yes. right, what's yes. wrong. Um, 
Wow, uh, that's telling. Yes. So do we not have any good stories to tell from our 50s, 60s? Uh, I'm, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, we will have plenty of good stories yeah. from our 50s oh, and 60s. I was actually asking maybe Dan. Well, he's, not, he's not that old yet. <laughs> he's, he's close to that. I was also going to ask the other storyteller here. Kim, do you, do you uh, how, do, how does it break down? I mean, j he just made a, Dan just made the statement that he made, but storytelling in general, what a huge, wide, open, creative right venture that is. Right, right, right. And I, I think that a lot of first time tellers reach back to earlier times, their childhood, mm. because it's sure. far enough away that they have some distance that they can reflect and give a little bit more um, of a big picture view as opposed to something that happened maybe last month or last year where they're still sort of emotionally involved in it and maybe aren't able to pull out the lessons that could be learned from certain experiences. Which is not to say you can't talk about it, but I I feel mm -hmm. like there's a lot of, once time starts passing and you start growing as a human, you start realizing that those significant moments, um, what they meant and how, how they've shaped you. And I think the real power of storytelling is in those moments of how you've grown as a human and what's really, that's really the thing that's, I think makes storytelling so powerful. The core of it. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. It, or the heart of it. Well, you know, I got to say that uh, I think, I don't know what it is, what the scientific basis is, but I think partly we remember stuff from our youth uh, more than we do from later on. Because, like, I, I can't sing songs from m more modern songs, but I can remember doo-wop tunes. Yes. I actually can remember learning... Uh, <clears throat> singing John Brown's body, Liza Moldrin in the grave, you know, singing about John Brown, the great abolitionist. And uh, uh, I was talking to some younger people, and they they don't even know that song. I'm just I'm just throwing this in because uh, riding around out there in Kansas and Missouri recently, I uh, thought a lot about John Brown and how important a figure he was in our history. And uh, uh, the guys in the car with me who were they didn't even know about the, the, the eight, song. The 18-year-olds. Well, no, I'm talking about their dads who were in their 40s. So that's uh, I'm just. Anyhow, that's that's one of my favorite tunes forever. And long live John Brown. <laughs> so let's uh, let's uh, Dan. You got a little piece you're gonna recite. I don't know, Kim. Do you have something too you're gonna share? I don't. You I don't. Want, I want to glory. I want to delve into Dan's beautiful story oh. and, and and just love it. <laughs> well, we're gonna take the time for you to do just that delving. Excellent. Uh, Dan, are you comfortable with our shared microphone thing here? I'm gonna move it over to you. Uh, well, this story. I, I, I was going to bring a little excerpt from the actual piece that I do, I'm doing uh, tomorrow night at 7.30 at the Side Project Theater and decided uh, one of the things that's so good about this project as a writer is that it forces you to uh, condense. And in the condensing you have to choose what, what you're going to keep and take away. So I thought rather than read some excerpts from the performance uh, tomorrow night, I would read from the larger version from which that, uh, ex that tomorrow's night performance is taken and give a little more context of the backdrop of what the story is about and maybe not uh, have a spoiler <laughs> alert uh, come out from the story. So this is actually one of the things that's most impacting um, for a lot of young black men is their first, or young, or anyone, women or men, their first encounter with uh, racism, sexism, and how that forms or impacts them. So uh, that's from this, this is that, that story. Okay. <clears throat> I grew up in the turbulent 60s. My formative years unfolding on Chicago's far south side. At the time, my family was living in and adjusting to one of CHA's Chicago Housing Authority's public housing units, commonly referred to as the projects. I say adjusting because living in subsidizing housing meant being stigmatized as poor, ignorant, and lazy, and as a hardworking, proud, black Catholic family, none of these stereotypes other than poor fit my parents' love of knowledge or our family's work ethics. Looking back on it, the term projects was quite apropos given Chicago's neighborhood's racial dynamics and the societal dimensions of the time. The term was particularly meaningful if you gave any credence to the urban myth 
that projects were the result of a study done by some covert, as in white, think tank as a way to contain the spreading problems of poor, black, and migrant populations of the late 40s, 50s, and early 60s. The results of the study supposedly showed that when mice were contained in a constricted area, stacked on top of each other, and given little provisions, the confined mice turned on each other, becoming hostile, aggressive, and cannibalistic. Black paranoid, <laughs> quote, Par military groups display city maps that showed projects were most often surrounded by police stations, railroads, and interstate highways, which in fact were renamed, renamed defense highways, designed and ready to ship distant and blacks to well-maintained, operational, ready World War II internment camps in the event of a riot, or depending on what side of the tracks you lived, revolution. This was the burgeoning state of affairs and state of mind in 1960 when my family moved into Lowton Holmes Project, located ironically between Interstate 294 and the railroad tracks on Chicago's far south side. Nice, Dan. Ooh. Let's hear it for Dan Ooh. McNeil. Ooh. Well, I, what, that brought to mind a lot of things, but uh, one of them is like... Uh, They've torn down a lot of these so-called projects. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I remember those Robert Taylor homes down there between the expressway and the railroad tracks. I actually had heard there was a, um, a kind of a railroad track that went into an underground place that they could just bring people in and out and keep them underground. And so I don't know what's become of that. Mm. I think that is a true thing. I'm not sure about that one, Michael. Well, all right. <laughs> Anybody give me I, some information? I do, know, I do know about the train tracks in Chicago. I think they might have been talking about going under the big viaduct, which now Millennium Park is built over those train tracks. But now, this it didn't was exist something. Then. This was uh, in case of some real stuff coming down. Well, I'm sure they had that covered. I mean, uh, I grew up on the south side, too, and I know exactly what you're speaking of, Dan. And... Uh, well, it, it, We've compared uh, notes in yes, the past about yes. our, our uh, various journeys, and one time soon we're going to have to have Jack Mack up here talking about the West Side. Well, he is going. coming on on November 17th, That's just so, so we're clear. That's good. But uh, in, your, in your rap there, Dan, you talked about, uh, you used an analogy of mice confined to a small space. Do uh, you think that, that uh, even though the projects in many ways have been torn down, people are still certainly concentrated in, in confined neighborhoods, surrounded by protection? Uh, we have a situation where the, the, you know, a lot of young people in the black community are going at each other big time. Mm -hmm. uh, any thoughts on this con contemporary situation in light of the information and the story you just told? Well, I, I, I do think that there is still um, a certain amount of um, almost instinctual uh, separation. Uh, one of the reasons I like living in Rogers Park because it is so diverse. Um, I think there's a lot less of that structural uh, segregation going on. I think now the media and stuff are starting to create these pockets of uh, uh, mental or, um, or group seg segregations. Um, how, so how do they do that? Well, I, I just think what's, what's going on with the media is having such an impact on defining uh, young people are, are looking to belong. That's one of the main things. And, and, and looking for uh, ver self-verification or validation. And I think they're getting their information from uh, medias where now a lot of stuff is just, it's, you know, it seems like it's so cool now to be disrespectful, to be, uh, to put down. It's like, you know, it's not just let me feel better, but I have to put someone else down. And so it's, so the media and and, um, it's having this this uh, impact of forming uh, certain mind concepts or ways of being. You know, you, the program you work with that Michael made mention of um, the Family Matters up here on the north side does so much to fill the gap for kids uh, and and then some. I mean, it's just so uh, comparatively so rich for these kids to have you and all your fellow staff. Um, and to create such a safe place to bring out their arts. Um, how has your storytelling, your poetry, you've always been a poet, as far as I know, all the years I've known you, um, uh, I know you've brought that to these guys. And what is your experience of inviting that coming from them as well? 
Well, I, you're new. Young people, as, as all humans, need, a, need the healing power of expression. And so if, if what we do is have them to express themselves, not only through writing, yeah, we're coming from a belief that um, everyone has a God-given innate gift and talent, um, whether you call it God or nature or DNA. And so what we're doing is to try to help the young people at a very important time discover some of their gifts and talents to take those gifts and talents and apply it to a project uh, that then helps the uh, sense of team become very real. And so then the talent supports the project, the project supports the individual talents, and whether it's writing or filmmaking or drumming or acting, all these things produce a sense of team and help the young men um, and women to have a, a sense of self which gives them a sense of validation, a sense of self-authenticity at a very crucial time in their development. <laughs> well, you do great work up there, Dan, and I'm really looking forward to seeing you in your performance tomorrow night at the Side Theater Project. Uh, and that starts at, what, 7 o'clock? I tell you what, how about we have Kim Morris give us a little more information, not only on the performance tomorrow night, uh, the ongoing show, and then I want to, just before you guys get out of here, I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Um, okay, so it's the Choosing to Be Here Festival of Storytelling. It's at the Side Project, um, which is 1439 West Jarvis, and we are doing performances Sunday through Wednesday, starting tomorrow.